Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, we are going to start our network session about generative AI. And for this session, we will have different speakers that will contribute to our uh, discussion here. We will have two online participants. That is Eloisa Candelo from IBM Research, Caio Machado from Instituto Vero in Oxford University. Uh, we have uh, Roberto Zambrana present in person and also Mateus Petroni. So uh, I will invite the online speakers to start our discussion. Uh, so Eloisa, could you please start your initial remarks? Thank you, Jogo. I'm going to start. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. And then we, we can start. Thank you so much for the introduction. One second. So uh, I'm Eloisa Candelo. I'm a research scientist at, uh, and a manager at IBM Research Brazil. Um, I have a group that's called the Human Centered and Responsible Tech. And we have several projects that the aim is to have social impact and using AI. For the last eight years, I'm conducting and researching. Um, I'm conducting and researching uh, in the intersection of HCI and AI, uh, particularly in conversational systems. So this picture illustrates one of my current projects that aims to measure social impact of financial initiatives using AI. Okay, uh, in the area of conversational systems, we had several projects to understand the perception of text-based machine outputs, for example, in this first one. Uh, this is an example, this is just a, a series of uh, examples to look at the conversational systems and the main challenge that uh, we are studying for a long time and now with large language models, how those challenges are enhanced and how can we take care of those uh, issues that were before that, but with the new technologies, we have uh, to, to pay more attention and uh, think deeply how is the impact of those new technologies. So for example, uh, the first one that I was mentioning was in 2017 and we measure how typography text was perceived by humans in chatbots. So we did a kind of twin test to understand about the humanness of uh, machines. And then we worked with multi agents and multi bots and how people collaborated with agents representing financial products to make, make investment decisions. Um, and then with the first, the same platform, uh, we did an art exhibition where bots talk to each other and uh, the humans talk to the bots. And, uh, um, and this exhibition we did in a cultural venue in Brazil. And the idea is to have the same platform as, as the moot bots that we had before. And in this one, we had uh, um, three characters of a book Capitu, Bentinho, and Escobar, that are uh, characters of a book from a famous novel in Brazil. And we measured how audiences perceived the interaction of uh, uh, those chatbots uh, on the table. So people typed, and there was a projector that projected their answers that uh, were designed and uh, drawing, drawed uh, on the table. So we also look at that, uh, how the engagement was, uh, if the chatbots, they um, asked people for their names and uh, they addressed it, they, they used the direct address. So 
this was something that we also look at. We also did uh, uh, our work when we answer uh, this one that people are looking at the pictures. Actually, they are talking to the paintings as well. <laughs> they are asking, oh, what's this yellow color? And then the system answers, what is that? So we can think about uh, now that we are going to reflect about prompts as well. And last year we launched this exhibition in a science museum in Brazil that uh, children can teach the robots. So they teach examples of uh, how humans talk and similar examples of the same statement. So the robots can learn with them. And we also have a kit for teachers to work in the school with them. And finally, the last one is one of my recent studies. One of the research studies that um, we did with a collaboration with a big bank in Brazil. And we studied how people, they train machines, chatbots in the banks. So those people were the best people that uh, worked in the call centers, the best employees. Uh, and they train uh, Watson, that's the chatbot there. So it's a room full of people to make sure that uh, the bot will uh, understand the clients. And there are a lot of articulation of work happening there. So how the curators, they interact uh, with each other uh, to, to create those answers, the chatbot answers. So we see that uh, we can have um, <laughs> an ice cream full of challenges that uh, we, we researched and uh, a lot of people researched in the ATI community. So we have, for example, uh, errors, how can we minimize and mitigate errors? Uh, we have uh, turn taking, if you have uh, more, than chat, more than one chatbot, for example, we have the problem of interface humanization and uh, how people can be deceived by bots. Uh, we also have the scope visibility in that time of conversational user interfaces because if the chatbot does not know how to answer, it will answer, I don't understand, or please, can you repeat your question? With the new technologies, this is not an issue because it always answers something. Malicious uses as well. Uh, and resolutions of ambiguities were something that the, those creators that I just mentioned, they, they use it to do every day. Um, transparency was also an issue. Uh, discrimination and harms and bias, and we're going to talk more about this in this session. So with generative AI and the use of large language models, what changed if we think? As I mentioned in the beginning, the scale is much higher, like the ability to ingest and process, process huge amounts of data. It's, it's huge compared to the conversational systems that we had before. So we can have the same task adapted and uh, to, to multiple tasks. And this could be that we have an automation also, and also maybe different uh, contexts. So for example, uh, we, we had a client that worked with cars and uh, for each car, they had to do a different chatbot. So, we use certain models, we can use the same parameters and just change the car, the model of the car and use the same uh, corpus. Uh, emergence as well and the scale. So it can do like a, a, a parallel uh, communication as well, fluency and the mood step reasoning. And it can learn and continue <laughs> doing uh, in certain models. I'm going to focus more in conversational systems. That's the, the main area that I came from. So now we can think about all those challenges and we have the additional challenges about hallucination, for example, uh, false and harmful language generation due to the lack of, a, a, of model control 
and the safeguards. That's why now we are creating several platforms that we can control the models and fine tuning those models. Misaligning of expectations. So you have the human expectation and the, actually what happens and that, what the model can deliver. Uh, so generate contents that are not aligned to to the human's expectation or expectations of certain communities. We are going to talk uh, in a little bit about vulnerable communities so we can just understand a little bit better which kind of values we also look at and the lack of transparency. So it's difficult to inspect because the quantity of data that is there and also how the algorithm was made, yeah. Um, so for example, before we have this uh, um, exhibition that I mentioned to you, that was an exhibition that we could have three bots and you have the three heads and people could interact with that. And what happened is like, uh, if people, they type it something that the bots didn't recognize the characters of this book and it was a closed uh, scope here. It's, it's not like an open scope, it's just phrases from the book, statements. Then uh, one of the chatbots would say more coffee or something like that. But in the case of the generative AI, we have the hallucinations and the always answer is more reactive than proactive, right? So um, we, we experienced in some projects that if you have interfaces, conversational interface that are more proactive, you have less errors as well, because it's more like a script conversation. And now this is not a reality anymore, it's more reactive to prompt. And if you have a prompt design, a way to insert information and ask uh, the system uh, based on large language models, what you want with more details, maybe you, you increase the chance that uh, uh, the system will answer you what you want. Automation, we talked about that, large data sets as well, and the harmful language. So in this case that I showed you, it was a public space. So we had like uh, people, we had a character that was a woman, a woman, and uh, we had like uh, several not uh, um, suitable language that was typed uh, to, to the bot. So everything that was typed on the tablet actually didn't show in the table, but the chatbots answer the, the phrases of the book, but we saw in the corpus because we analyzed the corpus as well. We published this paper too. So harmful language uh, it's, is there, is inherent and the norm. now it can be more evident. So going on that, uh, I also mentioned this, uh, it was a project that we did, and you can see that's 2017, and I brought on purpose <laughs> to see that it's the same thing in the way that now we have uh, conversational systems that are more eloquent and can deceive people. So in this study, uh, people look at that, uh, com a conversational system with a financial agent, and they should say if the financial advisor, financial agent was a human or a machine, and then why? And we saw that uh, when uh, people received a text that they could see the typeface of the um, agent, uh, as uh, the typeface, as uh, a script typeface, like a a handwriting typeface. Uh, they said, oh, it's a machine anyway. So most of the people, they said that were machines, but uh, this one wants to deceive me. So until, uh, what's the limit to be human? So this is one thing that we can think. And one of my favorite books is The Most Human Human. So Brian Christian, uh, actually, I, I'm going to quote him again later. Um, he studied the Turing test and instead of uh, looking at people that pretend to be machines, he looked at the qualities that uh, humans should have to be humans. So what are the qualities that 
uh, describe a human. So we maybe uh, should look and pay more attention on that. Yes. Um, okay. So when we look at that, at transparency as well, and uh, and if it's a human, if it's not a human, we maybe should think about communities that uh, the access uh, to education, to AI education, to technology education, uh, is is not so close to them. So what they have, for example, this is a community in Brazil, a low income, small business uh, uh, women, and they have access to technology because they have mobile phones and, and you can see this mobile phone, is their mobile phones, actually, they pay in several installments, so they have this and their contact is with WhatsApp, for example. So we did a, a, an experiment with them and we asked them what question does an AI need to answer to be useful, effective, and trustworthy, uh, to be trustworthy and respect the human rights and also democratic and so on. So we, we asked that and this system, what does, what it, uh, what's the output of this system? So this system, uh, they are part of a financial education course as well. It's uh, an NGO. And when they enter the course, they answer a questionnaire. When they leave the course, they answer a questionnaire. And after three and after six months, they answer another questionnaire. So what we did, we worked with the NGO and uh, we add those questionnaires and we redesign the questions to add in a chatbot. And those women, they answered. And while they were answering, they were answering about their business. They were answering uh, questions related to women empowerment. They answered questions related to uh, business growth as well and about uh, revenue. But the main thing about uh, this system and the questionnaires was to extract some indicators to measure the social impact of the program. Um, so we, we used this with them. Uh, we tested with 70 women. And um, as an output for them, uh, they could see how is the health of their business, their business health. Uh, so we had like a scale and they could see that. But then when we tested with them, we had several that uh, had like zero, for example. And why zero? So one of them said, this result means nothing to me. It won't not uh, let, uh, I, I will continue engaged to do my business. So the index was zero because my business is not really running. I'm not going to say it's dying. I'm going to say it's being born. I would like to know how it's uh, my advertisement. So uh, I can talk a little bit about that. But before about the zero, it's important because for some of them, it was like uh, not exciting and uh, very frustrating to see zero. And we needed to understand it why. So one of them, uh, the husband paid, the ex-husband paid the, the rent and uh, she count that in the expense, but in the end she had of uh, profits as well. So those things that are so uh, futile, how can I say? So, so little, but makes a lot of difference because they are intrinsic in the context. Other things that women that wanted the chatbot to, to tell them, I would like to know uh, how it's my advertisement and if I'm doing, I'm in the right path, what are the recommendations? Uh, we asked about their vision about the future. Uh, and this was something, ah, I like this. I want to continue answering this because then it makes me reflect about, yeah. And it means, for example, ah, the score I can improve, yeah, but I don't have structures yet. So this is like a kind of delicate because maybe they are not in the stage that they feel 
well about that. Yeah. So I think, uh, it, ah, and some uh, mistakes about uh, education. Um, so mistakes about the terms, for example, uh, uh, education and polite is something that uh, uh, it's a word that's similar in, in Portuguese. And religion is a, an interesting fact. It is the NGO we said, oh, should we take off this question? And they said uh, religion is the one of the main things that they disagree about because they are in the same economic level, more or less, the same status. But then we have people from different religion and we put in the same WhatsApp group. Then uh, usually we have uh, uh friction there okay so how can the how can we legitimate what the chatbot uh, answers so maybe in the future this is one uh, provocation paper that we did we could have a score for each kind of uh, generative system and uh, with this score we can see how legitimate this is how transparent this is and where is this data came from, right? So in our project, we used closed scopes, closed domains uh, to avoid uh, hallucinations or at least mitigate a little bit of that because then at least the corpus is from the client. And the third one uh, that uh, I would like to mention, I'm almost finishing, we have the expectation alignment that I mentioned. So this is another one. So if we have generative systems, how the values of people, those are the values that we collected in the field, could be aligned to, to the values that we have from other stakeholders as well. And the AI is there in the middle. So here's an example of call center. For example, we expect productivity, first performance, speed, uh, efficiency, uh, faithful, and we need all that. But then when we look at the model, we need to choose models that are aligned to that. So we want a model that reduces hallucinations and that has the data representation of the public that is going to use, right? So um, I'm going uh, to end, yes, a uh, joke. And I'm going to end with that. Uh, we have some design principles as well that we can think about how can we build um, generative AI systems in a responsible way. So thank you so much. Thank you, Eloisa, for your great presentation share your wonderful work with us. Uh, so we, we had a, a view from the industry. So now I invite you, Roberto to bring a perspective from the technical community about the, those topics, this, those, this. So please, Roberto. I, I think that you, you can, should use mic for online people. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Yogo. And it's a pleasure for me to be with this distinguished panel. Mm. And, uh, sorry, it's okay, right? It's yeah, listening. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, what I, w I think it will be nice, I, I, I totally agree with Eloise about her intervention. So I would like to switch, to, to switch a little bit my, my comments regarding how it emerged, uh, specifically, of course, um, generative AI, since we have uh, uh, artificial, artificial intelligence for many years now uh, in different forms like using translators when we have uh, image recognition software and different other ways of using different forms as well of AI but I think one game changer indeed was ChatGPT, and it's not because there is there isn't any other tools there are many but of course this one was I, I will say the initial that was presented, um, I think it was in October last year, and uh, in, in a matter of, of maybe weeks, many people started uh, to use it, starting to be thrilled using this, uh, this tool, and then spreading the word, 
and in 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 terms of I don't know maybe in weeks it it passes from thousands of of users to hundreds of millions of users. So this one indeed I would say it's a particular phenomenon to to analyze. I, I don't remember any other tool that was uh, very very rapidly penetrate to to society. And I will say there is there is a factor that perhaps was included in, in, in regarding the use of this 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 uh, tool. It's not because of the fact that maybe people already use it, uh, different bots, but in this case, uh, initially many people were experimenting. But once they realized uh, this, the potential of this tool, then everyone started to use it for many many other activities. I mean, formal activities. What now, in some cases, in the academic world, we can even talk about maybe cheating or presenting uh, elements that na are not necessarily um, developed by academic students, learners, etc. But uh, uh, I, I will say that uh, many people felt that this tool was really without limits. And again, I will say that it can be applied in different ways now combined with some other forms of, of AI, actually there are people that are even making money now. <laughs> they, are, they, made, they found this as, as a way of making money. Well, I can talk about uh, um, my particular perspective is related to the technical side and related to the academia because I'm a teacher for the last uh, uh, 20 years more or less at the university. Um, M mostly in, in IT-related subjects. And uh, as happened with some other areas, in our case, the teachers, the students, when they learn about this tool, of course, they were thrilled. And they many, and this, uh, I would like to maybe uh, comment this story because perhaps it had this, this happens in some, in some other parts. But in, in, the, in my country, maybe not, even, not only in my university, but the people that uh, was encountering this this tool started to uh, wanted to formally um, tell the others about this, and then started to organize webinars, seminars, and, and things like that. Uh, in a way, trying to call them uh, such as experts in this field. Yeah. <laughs> Many people started to <laughs> feel like that, just because. They use it and they discover this fantastic tool. I wanted everyone to know I use. So I think that's another part, uh, as another important part that we need to reflect on. The other uh, comment that I wanted to make is that uh, yes, AI is with us for several years now, but maybe the uh, ethical aspects, the regulatory framework uh, is being discussed, I will say, maybe the last five years. And I can witness about us that because I, I was a member of the MAC during the last well past three years. Last year was my last year as a MAC member, and then I had a chance to to see how the um, discussion regarding the regulation of, of AI was evolving as well. And then it reaches the academic sector regarding all these possibilities or maybe even negative impacts that this may cause. And uh, this is something, and I think we are in that moment now, in, in back in Bolivia and perhaps in the region or even in the world, uh, with, uh, again, different, uh, different parts, I mean, uh, different sides of the coin. People that feel that, uh, again, this is like the devil, and we should try to avoid it, the <laughs> use. Maybe we should try to prohibit the use of yeah. this, these tools because they are teaching bad things to our learners, because the learners are, are trying to do or trying to pass for, for persons that they are not, etc. cetera. You, you understand my point regarding this. And then, of course, there is the other side that uh, actually would love to have this even more evolved. And uh, when we talk about regulation and we talk about the adjustment of maybe policies that we apply even in the academic sector, I think uh, that will not, that shouldn't be the way. Uh, um, and I will, I, I always like to put this example. I know that we should respect the difference of the scenarios, but uh, if you will remember back on, uh, back in the 70s, 60s, maybe no one here is going to remember mm -hmm. that that moment. 
<laughs> when we were using the sliding rule. Uh, of course, one of the skills that we required from our students was also, uh, of course, to, to know how to, to, to manage that kind of, of tool, right? Uh, but then uh, the packet calculators appear. So immediately, of course, it was important to adjust um, the, the curricular designs in the different areas and start to use, uh, I mean, start to, to evolve in, in a way in what was the need for our learners to, to learn. Uh, and I think that's the kind of reflection we need to do at the university. It's not about prohibiting the use of this kind of tools, but to adjusting what the skills, the new skills we need and we want for our students to have in the, in the, near, in the near future, knowing that now we have tools like this one, then of course are going to reduce a lot many, many of the activities in terms of time, of course, many of the activi activities that our students can do, and of course our teacher, and of course the acad academic community as a whole. So I will stop there. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Thank you, Roberto. So we had views from industry, from technical community. Now uh, I invite Caio Machado to give us a perspective from civil society, but also from the academia. Welcome, Caio, and the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great seeing all of you. Um, I'm going to quickly put a slide up with my contacts, but I won't use slide for my speech. It's just for um, having an opportunity to network with the folks over in Japan. Um, so if anyone wants to reach out, I'd be glad to, to continue our conversations later on. Um, so I hope you guys are seeing uh, the, the slide. OK, yeah. can I get a nod? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Yeah. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Great. So well, my, my concerns, when, when we're talking about generative AI and the title of our talk, Synthetic Realities, um, let's, let's stay, lay down a premise here. I think of issues related to um, artificial intelligence in, in three major layers. So the data, quality of the data, you know, diversity of the data set, whatever we use to train and develop the models, the engineering of the models themselves, and the final layer, which is deployment. And that's when we get a tool, throw it into society, and then it behaves in ways that are unexpected. Um, I think a great case for that, and it's kind of a cliche case, it's, it's an algorithm tool, it's not even AI from what I understand, is Compass case where algorithmic tools were used uh, in certain states in the United States. And for on, on the one hand, the algorithm was biased. So we do have an issue uh, in the bottom layers in terms of data and development of that tool, but also judges started using something that was intended to attribute risk to the defendants and use them to, to determine the severity of the sentences. So what was intended for one purpose, once it was thrown out into the world, people incorporated it and, and it was embedded into society in different ways. And that is harder for, for us to foresee. And I think that is an issue um, that is much greater than we were discussing. I, I do agree that hallucination, error, all of this is a very severe problem, but we're not thinking as much as what happens once the AI is out in the world. For example, I know that lawyers, judges around the world are using generative AI. What is the impact of that when a judge decides to pay $20 a month to use ChatGPT and all of a sudden ChatGPT is deciding the cases and making a precedent? <laughs> so I think that that's a big concern. My second concern, again, addressing the issue of synthetic realities is not so much um, the fabrication of extremely uh, realistic content, which is an issue, I acknowledge deep fakes and so on, but I think that will be addressed in the midterm uh, with new mechanisms of developing trust. 
what I'm really concerned about is how these tools become infrastructure of access to information. The same way we use Google to access information today and you get 10 results and depending the words you put in, you get different results for where dinosaurs came from. It could be an evolutionist theory. It could be a creationist theory. Um, when you have a chat doing that and everything is compacted into a single answer, what, uh, what sort of uh, tools do we have to, second, to, to double check that and to equip the users um, to be able to fact check that, to get different perspectives? So I think in the sea of information we have, the, the, the eye drop is getting smaller and more complex and, more, and less transparent. And I think that plays a big role in creating distortions in, in our readings of reality. So speaking of disinformation or even malinformation, I think these tools and the lack of accountability uh, around these tools and how they operate can have severe effects in, in that regard. And um, trying to be quick so we can all speak, uh, that obviously will refers back to things that were, were brought before by the previous speakers. So fairness, accountability, um, I think there's still little debate on how we can ensure at the development level means of accountability and fairness at the deployment level. So metrics, ways of keeping people from using the AI tools for unintended purposes. Um, this is a more conceptual proposition. I, I don't see any, I, I'm throwing this issue to the engineers. As a lawyer, I can throw it to the engineers that you think of solutions. Uh, but this was something I, I was uh, discussing with some folks here at the School of Engineering is how can we think of fairness metrics and how, somehow have that dialogue with the user and have the user think through how the AI is being deployed. And that also speaks to what was mentioned before on AI literacy and tech literacy in general. And finally, uh, just to, to point to some of the work that we're doing right now, uh, I am academically, I'm at Oxford, but right now I'm also a fellow at the School of Engineering here, learning a lot with, with the engineers. And we're thinking a lot about the uncertainty around different models of machine learning where, okay, you might have 95% of accuracy across different models, but then you have that 5% where you're getting, you're getting predictive multiplicity. And what do you do with these people? And who has the legitimacy to decide what should be done with these people? So you can look at the work from Professor Flavio Calmon, uh, Lucas Monteiro, they're, they're really going off into this, in this topic and we're working together. And my, for me, the fundamental question here is, okay, there's a whole section uh, that algorithmic tools, a section of the population or users, or you name it, of the data that the, the algorithmic tools don't know what to do with and who should be able to decide. And so far, obviously, this is being answered by the team developing that, those models. But once this is deployed in society, the effects aren't restricted to code. These have social ethical uh, effects, which perhaps should be discussed in other spaces as well. With that, I'll, I'll conclude my speech and thank you once again for, for having me. Uh, please feel free to, to reach out so we can continue the conversation. Thank you, Caio. Uh, we have more five minutes. So I invite Mateus to give his contribution to this speech, to the session. Amazing. Thank you so much, Diogo. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matheus Petroni. I'm a master degree student at the Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. And I am in the field of design, human computer interaction and artificial intelligence. I'm also actively engaging the user exper experience designer uh, with the Latin industry. So I will add just a few things here to bring more of this user centric perspective uh, and also to not repeat with the other remarks that I am aligned with, okay? So one, one, 
On one hand, there are plenty of expect expectations concerning the potential benefits of these advancements. Uh, even with the content generated by AI being considered as synthetic realities, the proximity to users' actual experiences is so striking that this has the potential to overcome long-standing challenges uh, within the usability domain, such as the learning curves associated with new digital technologies, the enhancement of engagement through personali personalized experiences, and a more accessible way to obtain knowledge. This potential value extends to diverse domains, such as education, healthcare, well-being support services, digital communications, and even customer support. Uh, the human-like AI techniques showcased in specific chatbots serve as a prime illustration of this trend. Uh, Meta's recent introduction of 28 AI personas modeled, af modeled after well-known public figures is a case in point. Uh, they aim to provide users with valuable devices with the realms of the celebrity's expertise. Uh, in doing so, it sig significantly broadens the scope of engagement and diversifies the ways through which individuals can access digital support to address this their needs. From another side, despite the promises that these innovations hold, numerous concerns deserve our attention before we take further steps. In a world where a significantly part of digital content could be created partially or even entirely by AI in the next few years, facilitating tools to user to discern the origin and nature of this content becomes imperative. This underscores not only a governance and technical challenge, but also a design one, as we need to allow users to analyze a small mobile screen and recognize visual cues such as color, typography, iconography, or other elements that help them to get informed to make better decisions regarding its utilization. Additionally, we must remain vigilant regarding the potential dangers associated with the establishment of intimate and affective bonds with such, such technologies. Users may inadvertently develop strong emotion attachments to chatbots which could provo prove problematically if this chatbot fails to adequately meet their needs or if users become overly rea reliant on them. In this realm of education and mental health support, such attachments could compromise social and learning skills and the significance of sharing experiences with peers, families, and the surrounding community. Beyond that, if we start to prospect a little bit more about possible futures, we could consider the possibility of users simulating their own presences to automated chatbots on social media platforms. This idea invites us to have a critical examination of what is inherent human, such as having a unique personality, and how we can effectively communicate the capabilities of these emerging technologies without overpromising features that the current state of AI may not, or even should not, deliver. In conclusion, I believe that there are huge room for improvements in our forensic technologies to detect and label content created by generative AI, sometimes to indicate the user about its nature, sometimes to prevent the dissemination of content that threatens human rights, democracy, or propagates misinformation. As example, the same case of artists being used for personalized chatbots as Meta launched could be applied for artists performing deep fake videos with harmful or untruthful narratives, a phenomenon that is increasingly prevalent. Say that, I invite you to reconsider the significance of presenting essential information alongside the user interface, promoting a, promoting a robust culture of fact-checking and content differentiation. These emerging challenges require collective efforts from government, society, and research to safeguard democratic values and individual freedom in the face of this rapidly evolving landscape. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mateus. So well, we, we had uh, inputs from different stakeholders groups, and now we have time for just one question, if you, someone wants to ask a question. Yes, please, you can go to the mic. Mic is on. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Valerius. I'm representing the KCGIS University here, and I'm a master degree student. So my question, and maybe one point that I would like uh, to speak about, is how the generative AI can be used for the crime and cybersecurity. So as we all know, now we can generate images. Now we can chat with the um, LLMs. My thinking is like now we can also mimic voice 
And what's stopping the bad people or the really people who want to do the harm using those tools to, for example, to generate somebody's grandma voice or to generate my voice and call my parents uh, requesting for money or for something um, closely related to that. So I just like thinking this is the point that needs further discussion and maybe a regulation, uh, like how we going to deal with this possible crime. This is going to be, in my eyes, extremely um, fast growing in the couple years when the algorithms going to become much more efficient and the output will be barely recognizable by human beings. Thank you. Thank you. So, Roberto, do you want to start answering? <laughs> sure. I will, I will go back to my previous point. <laughs> I will say that it's really, really hard to start thinking that regulation is going to resolve everything yeah. or if we're going to come up with some creative ways of dealing that kind of examples. Everything needs to change now. We need to adjust to this new reality. I can talk about the academic area. I'm not an expert in the crime, of course. <laughs> but I will say, just take an example, that it will be hard now to consider that uh, one image and a voice is a, a concrete evidence of a crime due to the, these new possibilities. And that is now fixed in the laws, in our current laws. So that's uh, an example of the things that need to be changed based on a reflection. And I will say that that will have to be in all different areas. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Caio, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, just to quickly compliment, uh, I mean, that's already a reality, for sure in the US, for sure in Brazil, the use of deep fake voices to, to run scams over WhatsApp in Brazil is very, very common. Uh, and becoming even more common. So that's uh, something we, we need to deal with. Um, uh, I think we can look back at the knife. We had knives around for thousands of years and still we created laws and that hasn't prevented people from stabbing each other. Uh, meaning that the tool is around, it will be used for good and for bad. I think that the policy, not only crime is in, regulation, market regulation, all sorts of rules we can think of need to be addressed to limit the circulation of um, these tools in whatever context they're used for criminal purposes, increase, uh, increase traceability, increase, uh, we should promote, so public policy to promote digital, digital literacy. Sorry, it's late here. Uh, to promote digital literacy and to get people to mistrust the audios and have other means of checking. So it's more of a, let's say, an ecosystem solution than passing one rule that will outlaw the misuse of deep fakes and voice and video, you name it. Uh, we don't have a, a silver bullet. It's a series of initiatives and rules that we need to promote. Thank you, Caio. So our time is over. I'd like to thank uh, uh, all the speakers and the audience and the session is closed. Thank you.